Muy buenas tardes. Welcome to the YouTube channel of Instituto Cervantes uh, Leeds and Manchester. First of all, I would like to, to welcome, to, to extend a warm welcome to our guest tonight, uh, Professor Cateri O'Leary, Professor Michael Thompson, and Professor Rosison. And some of you already know this uh, um, series of Slivers Publications in Hispanic Studies is a series produced in cooperation with Professor Rossi Song and uh, with which series what we try to, to bring to our audience, to, to the public, is the latest uh, publications in Hispanic studies in the academia. Professor Rossi Song, uh, who is, as I said, the coordinator of the series, is um, a head of the studies of the School of Modern Languages in, and Culture at Doran University. And she has published many works on contemporary Spanish culture, film and literature. Some of her publications include Lost in Transition, Constructing Memory in Contemporary Spain, a Taste of Barcelona, the History of Catalan Cooking uh, and Eating as co-author, and also The Traces of contamina Contamination, Unearthing the Francoist Legacy in Contemporary Spanish Discourse. Finally, she has also published uh, Towards a Cultural Archive of La Movida as co-editor. Her articles have appeared in Journal of Spanish Cultural Studies, MLN, Revista de Estudios Hispánicos, Romance Notes, Hispamérica, among many others. And now I will introduce our special guest tonight, Professor uh, O'Leary, studied international um, marketing and languages on Dublin City University before going to uh, complete a PhD in Spanish literature focused on the theater of Antonio Buero Vallejo at the University College in Dublin. Catherine O'Leary, a lecturer at the National University of Ireland until moving to St. Andrews in 2013, where she is Dean of Arts and Divinity. She is also Director of the Cultural Identity and Memory Studies Institute and co-chair of the Scottish Arts and Humanities Alliance. Professor O'Leary has published widely in, in contemporary Spanish theatre and her works include a monographical study of the theater of Antonio Buero Vallejo, and articles on Fernando Arrabal, Antonio Buero Vallejo, Carlota O'Neill, and the Nosotros Theater Group. Other publications include a companion to Carmen Martin Gaite with Alison Reveiro de Menezes, Legacies of War and Dictatorship in Contemporary Spain and Portugal, co-edited with Alison Ribeiro de Menezes, and Global Insights of Theatre Censorship, co-edited with Diego Santos Sánchez and Michael Thompson. Her work on, on translation includes also articles on Alfonso Sastre's versions of Scene of Casey's work, and one on translations of Jean Paul Sartre's Theatre in Spain. Professor Michael Thompson is Emeritus Professor at the School of Modern Languages and Cultures in Doran University. And he has a PhD from the University of Bristol and BA Honors in Spanish from the University of Doran. He taught and researched in Hispanic studies at the University of Doran uh, from 1984 until his retirement in September 2022. His research focuses primarily on the theater in Spain since the early 20th century. His most substantial project was collaboration with Professor Catherine O'Leary, uh, funded by the IAHRC research grant in 2008 and 2011. In this project, they investigated the theater censorship in Spain during the Second Republic, the Civil War, the Franco dictatorship, and also to the transition of democracy, as well as making connections with censorship in other times and places. He has also published work on individual play, uh, playwrights like uh, Federico García Lorca, 
Again, Antonio Buero Vallejo, Jose Maria Rodriguez Mendez, and Paloma Pedrero. Professor Thompson has also an interest in translation, especially in drama. He has translated plays by Buero Vallejo and Paloma Pedrero. Some of the books he has published include Global Insights on Theatre Censorship with Catherine O'Reilly, Thinking Spanish Translation, a course in translation method, Spanish to English with Louis Haywood and Sandra Hervey, Performing Spanish uh, History, Cultural Identity and Censorship in the Theatre of Jose Maria Rodriguez Méndez, Antes y Después del Quijote, Actas del Congreso 2005 de la Asociación de Hispanistas de Gran Bretaña e Irlanda, with Robert Archer, Stephen Boyd and Baldi at Balston, A New History of Spanish Writing, 1939 to 1990s, with Chris Perry and Susan Frank and Vanessa Knight, Fire, Blood and, Al and the Alphabet, 100 Years of Lorca, with Sebastian Dogart, Antonio Buero Vallejo, Un Soñador para un Pueblo, A Dreamer for the People, a Bilingual Edition. Well, today uh, we have the immense honor um, for Instituto Cervantes to uh, launch this wonderful, excellent uh, uh, book, Theater Censorship in Spain, 1931 to 1985, published by the University of Wales, an excellent and comprehensive study of the impact of censorship in theater on 20th century Spain. It draws an extensive archival evidence uh, with testimonies and in-depth analysis of legislation of the different periods of the dictatorship in Spain from the Second, Rep sorry, from the Second Republic to the dictatorship until the uh, uh, new uh, democracy times of the transition. I hope, I am sure you will enjoy the, the, uh, this event, uh, this launch of the book. And without further ado, we give the floor to, to Rosiso. Thank you to all of you. Thank you so much, Pedro Sevio, for those welcoming words and for introducing our guests uh, for tonight. Thank you so much, Mike and Catherine, for joining us for this conversation. Uh, I would like to thank also to all our uh, listeners and participants and followers of Ex Libris. I can't believe we have such a great crowd tonight uh, and we hope that you uh, follow this conversation with your questions uh, when we open the last part of this presentation. First, I'd like to congratulate again to uh, Mike and Catherine for this amazing work. I think uh, it's going to be such a valuable resource for future scholars and researchers on uh, not only theater in Spain, but just to understand uh, some of the cultural and political dynamics that was happening uh, from the Spanish Civil War onto uh, the Spanish transition. So can we start talking about this project uh, behind the monograph? Um, why censorship, theater censorship? And actually I'm interested in discussing sort of the time span of the book. Actually, you take a very long view to this idea and practice of censorship. In fact, your first chapter even goes before the initial 1931 that is listed in the title and goes all the way back to the 1830s. So uh, why this long view? Is there a reason for it that is perhaps specific to Spain? Um, the, the, the genesis of this was, uh, in the first place, was me and Catherine working on um, theater in Spain, working on particular playwrights, um, becoming increasingly aware of um, the impact of censorship on those playwrights. Um, and, and I was working on Rodriguez Mendez, and it became more and more clear that, uh, that one really had to understand um, the whole censorship environment in order to understand what happened to his theater and and how it was performed and not performed and received and and unable to be received and um so it, it really became more and more important to to get behind those particular playwrights and then that grew into a oh well we should be not just looking at the work of particular playwrights but the whole scene um and so that that's what generated the 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 initiative in the first place um and as for the 
the long view, um, I think we wanted to do more than um, what had been done in some other places um, where there had been a big concentration just on the dictatorship um, and just on particular kinds of theater. Um, and that, that seemed too narrow a perspective. We really wanted to um, partly um, show that what the Franco dictatorship was doing was not totally unique. It's not as if they invented censorship. <laughs> um, it, there was plenty of it going on before that, um, but in particular forms. And so it really seemed important to show an evolution right out of the 19th century into the earlier 20th to show what was particular about the Francoist version of it. That is still the core of the book, yes, but we definitely wanted to show what was particular about that version of it, what it took from earlier versions of censorship, and what it and in which ways it was it was innovative in working out particular ways of doing it that were new in Spain. Um, so I I I I really thought that was essential. I, Catherine had had her doubts about going right back to the 1830s. <laughs> But I insist on that. Um, and and, and fact, I think it's right that it gives us a a, a, a brief, if you like, a, a summary that gives us an understanding, a way in, because as we found, as we looked at censorship, you can always take one step back. Um, and what you're looking at now is related to what was done before, or it, you can understand it better in contrast um, with what went before. So I think... Yeah, I think Mike's right. It was it was worth doing that that long view as an introduction to what we did. But we were both working really in the same period. We were both looking at realist dramatists um, under Franco, and we met a few times at the Hispanus conference and uh, had conversations about maybe we should do something together or maybe we should do a little bit more. And then it was yeah, what should we do? And I guess some of the 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 bulk of the time frame from the Republican period to pushing out past the transition sort of suggested itself as we as we conversed. Yeah, and I think that actually that long view, it, it really is useful. At least I found it incredibly valuable to actually engage with one of your arguments for this project, which is not only about censorship in a very specific historical moment, but through these uh, study, try to develop an understanding of the nature and practice of censorship in general, right? And I think that this case is actually quite well presented in the organization of your book, because each topic that you present through the many chapters of this book is followed up by a case study, right? So can you talk a little bit about that combination between sort of the topic and this case study? And I think that some of the topics that you address in these chapters are well that, well known actually, right? So it's not quite surprising, let's say, for example, the use of propaganda or how censorship um, stayed on even after the dictatorship. Uh, but I think there are other bits that could be quite surprising to, to the readers. Um, could you highlight some of these topics that you found uh, interesting as you were uh, putting together this project and perhaps uh, discuss some of the cases as you see that might be interested to interesting to our to our listeners to this afternoon? Sure, yeah. Um, we, we were inspired by another publication, weren't we, Catherine? <laughs> which which book was that 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 we um it was um, a book on Irish theatre history by somebody called Chris Morash, who I used to work with. He was in an English department at the University of Maynooth, but he's now a professor of English at Trinity College in Dublin. And uh, he did, a, a, I suppose, a, a long view of, of Irish theatre history. But at the end of each chapter, he had a case study. So he wasn't looking at censorship but he had a case study called A Night at the Theatre um, that shows, showed how a particular performance um, actually shifted things within the theatre world. Um, so we thought that's a really nice idea that we could adapt to what we were doing. Yeah, and we, we knew so that- Do you want to say something about one of your cases and yeah. then I could say a little yeah. about mine? We, we knew that um, with the amount of stuff that we were trying to pack into this book, that we, we, with a lot of the 
examples. They were going to have to be dealt with quite briefly in the body of each chapter. But we wanted some part of the book to go into a reasonable amount of detail. So um, and and not just on the contents of the censorship files, but on, uh, say, reception of the play and events around the uh, the premiere and so on. So we really wanted to give a sense of uh, of the impact of the action of censorship on a particular play, on a particular occasion. On uh, and so we focus on reviews and what happened on the night and so on in these in in these various case studies. Um, I suppose I'd like to highlight one from chapter four, which is the chapter where we've um, reviewed the, pro the, the sort of chronology of censorship throughout the dictatorship. And then um, we, we, we set out some interesting cases, mostly from quite early on, sort of 1940s and, and into the 1950s, where um, it was not teatro critico that was being censored. It was quite normal, everyday, mainstream stuff um, being affected by censorship in a variety of ways. And I think that's quite an important chapter um, because it, it does some of the things that some other accounts of theatre censorship haven't done. Um, and, there, and there are some nice surprises in that chapter. <laughs> the surprise about Eche Garay and the, and the mm. surprise about the, um, the right-wing plays celebrating the 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 alfamiento and the victory and and the dictatorship themselves being censored surprisingly um and uh, i was quite glad that we managed to to account for why that was happening um but the case study at the end of that chapter is a benavente play mm. so i made sure that that i went and looked in fact i was prompted by giving a talk at the spanish embassy in madrid <laughs> in, in conjunction with the instituto cervantes which was a series about Nobel Prize winners. So I volunteered to, to do one on two theatrical Nobel Prize winners. So there was Benavente and Eche Garay. Uh, but I, I threw in a, a bit of a, <laughs> an unusual element, which was these bits of censorship files. Um, and uh, Eche Garay was a, was a real surprise that one censor Try, tried to ban El Gran Galeotto, <laughs> which is absolutely extraordinary. He failed, but I think he had very good reasons for doing so. Um, but the, the Benavente play is La Infanzona, um, which I, I think most historians of Spanish theatre and critics was not, would not spend a lot of time on. It's not a massively important play, not Benavente's most interesting, um, but it created an extraordinary amount of fuss. Um, amongst the censors. And so partly it was uh, the, the the interest there is looking at why that particular play from, from the 1940s, it's a post-war play, um, was censored and it was delayed. It, it was put forward for censorship in 1941 and it, um, and it got sort of suspendida um, and then it was forgotten about for a while. And then, um, and then the companies, uh, various companies tried again and they did manage to get approval in 1947. So to begin with, it was a, oh, why was this play censored? And it was largely sort of religious reasons, unsurprisingly, that, that's the sort of thing that keeps coming up. Um, but then the really interesting stuff is about when the play was actually going to be performed in Zaragoza. Um, it was then the local authority, it was the mayor of the city, took it upon himself to ban the performances <laughs> but, but by a very prominent company. Um, uh, and it was all the fuss that was kicked up around that decision that, that's the really interesting material. Um, and, it, in a, and it illustrates one of the themes that goes through the early development of the censorship mechanism, which was that the regime found it rather difficult to construct something that really would work right across the nation and at all levels of theatrical activity, which is what they were aiming for. Um, and, and, and in this case, the, there was an interesting conflict of jurisdictions in which the, the departamento back in Madrid, um, the Dirección General, was, was having to assert its authority and try to prevent the mayor in Zaragoza from stopping this performance because it was a matter of who had the authority um, and it, and then it all got linked in with the press because the the mayor was using the press to put his argument and then the 
the di the Direction General jumped in there and, and suppressed various press stories in order to put <laughs> their part of the argument. So it's just a fascinating um, moment of the regime still tr trying to work out how to do this business um, and establish a real nationwide authority. Catherine. Yeah, Catherine, and yeah. I think I think um, what we're trying to do with the case studies as well is to to show the range of censorship. So the type of censorship that most people are familiar with is the censorship of the so-called realists or the committed dramatists, those who are very clear in their opposition to the regime. So, for example, mm -hmm. we looked at um, Alfonso Sastre's Esquadra hacia la Muerte, which mm. in fact was not originally censored. It was authorized without cuts and staged. And on the third night, it was seen by um, a general who objected to it. Um, and what we can see in the documents from the archives is the toing and froing, the negotiations that go on behind the scenes, um, the persuasion. Um, on the part of dramatists and directors, um, which sometimes works, sometimes fails. Um, and then we can also see what the political moment means. Um, what is the impact of what's going on in society or in politics um, and how this affects what's on stage that particular night. So it allows us to have this kind of deep dive as, as Mike suggests, um, but also to put together what we can see behind the scenes with what's in the public eye. Um, so Esquadra Alcia Muerte, as I say, one of the most famous examples, the play was on stage. It was staged for three nights successfully, and then it was withdrawn. But actually what we see behind the scenes is that had an impact not only on that play that night, mm -hmm. but it also um, had an impact on how plays by Sastre were seen from then on and how he was viewed because he had been seen as a friend of the regime because of his own family background. Um, and he had been, because he was a member of um, certain student groups. But Sastre had already moved on from that, but the regime hadn't recognised it. Um, so that changed. Also, what changed was the military had been asked to look at this play um, and to look at some other plays by Sastre and the view that they gave that even if the play is probably written by somebody who is on our side, if it is open to misinterpretation, then it's a problem. And that idea then was used in other circumstances with other playwrights. So in fact, while it's about Esquadra hacia Muerte and that night, it's also about how things shifted. Um, and the other e interesting example, um, again, not choosing a very obvious example from the period of the Republic, we look at a religious play by a very minor playwright who was really a, a, a priest who wrote plays um, on the side. Um, and the play was found acceptable by the Republican government, but the case study shows how what's going on in society, the polarization, mm -hmm. the fact that religion is being used politically in, um, in society and in the political sphere is also being echoed in what's happening on stage. And in this case, there is a protest in the theater um, by somebody who initially is not it's is not identified it turns out to be antonio sanchez barbudo who's a very um significant public intellectual um certainly later um but it also involves uh pedro muñoz seca honorio maura pilar miliana stre and um, some important names who are playwrights um of the right if you like mm -hmm. and it's all played out in the press this mm -hmm. conflict over a play that's not really about the play at all. Right. So actually, you do mention so many sources and in a way sort of present or build a context to revisit these works, right, in the process of being both presented, performed, censored, and so on. Can you talk briefly about the archives that you've consulted to actually uh, sort of find these, these documentation? I mean, clearly there are some uh, obvious ones, but it seems that you had to be quite creative as well to sort of build these cases. 
Yeah, yes. I mean, there, there is there's obvious material in the Archivo General de la Administración, and um, we weren't the first researchers to, to head there. <laughs> um, the, the person who really did a massive amount of work in that archive was Berta Muñoz Cali, um, who, who did a fantastic PhD at the University of Alcalá de Henares and published that PhD. And, and that that is a wonderful, useful resource. Um, and where we were, in fact, sort of partly <laughs> defining our task by what we could do that wasn't what had already been done by Berta. Um, but it, it's a wonderful archive that I have spent many, many happy hours <laughs> sitting in there, getting those boxes out and rifling through those envelopes of documents. And uh, so it's it's very rich material, but um, it, it needed to be contextualized in various other ways. So we, we had to look at legislation as well. We had to look at press material, um, re reviews and, and stories in the press. Um, and for some parts of this, it was uh, necessary to go further afield in terms of archives. Looking at um, the Civil War period, for instance, the, the, the Aga has virtually nothing from that period because different forms of censorship were operating then. Mm -hmm. So I was very glad to find all kinds of stuff in the um, uh, Centro Documental de la Memoria Histórica in Salamanca. Um, so I, that was kind of speculative. I just went and thought, well, let's see what there is and do some searches with teatro, espectáculos, censura, um, and see what comes up. Um, and so I just did some very fascinating piecing together of, of bits of evidence for that chapter, um, just getting stuff uh, about how the, the collectivization of the theatre operated and all the records that were, were left over of of meetings and discussions and um, decisions by various comités and juntas and things. So I, I think that did allow us to pin down quite a lot of what was going on during that period, um, together with press sources and so on. Um, it was sort of alarming to be able to use that material because it's the Fondo Politico Social that was essentially the material mm -hmm. gathered together by Franco's people after the war to use as evidence against people in, in criminal proceedings, uh, criminal in inverted commas. Um, so it, it was sort of awful that that material was so useful, but 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 it's there and, and it does tell quite a lot of interesting stories. Um, and then the Archivo Nacional de Catalunya in San Cugat del Valles outside Barcelona was also pretty useful for filling in some more of the, the Catalan dimension, which Catherine. I wanted to make quite a lot of. I, I wanted Catalonia to be Right, yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Catherine, do you have any experience with these archives? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, again, I spent quite yeah. time. I mean, do you want to yeah, add any other? Yeah. No, not really. I think uh, Mike has, has covered it in terms of how important the archives were. Um, and I think we spent quite a lot of time trawling through um, publications um, to do with legislation and also um, looking at newspaper archives as well. And thankfully, most of these are online. Um, so that certainly helped. Um, but we did have a research assistant um, who spent time in the archive in Alcala and was able to gather a lot of material. I mean, mm. you know, we have material that we have not used. We have so much, um, but it, it was wonderful. So we both have experience of being in the archive, but we also mm. were able to gather quite a lot. And there are gaps. There is still mm. material oh, yeah. out there that nobody's looked at and that may appear, hopefully, at some point. So there is more work to be done. There are That's... thousands of cajas in that archive. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and we've only looked at a few of them. Yeah, we, uh, I'm, I'm glad Catherine yes. mentioned our, our research associate. We we should pay tribute to the work of Diego Santos Sanchez, um, who worked for the project for three years, spent an awful lot of time in the archive, hmm. and did some very um, intelligent and 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 well focused choosing of material, deciding what's worth looking at, um, transcribing it fully for us. Um, so we we built up a, a wonderful collection of material thanks to having that that labour yeah. at our disposal, and he did a very good and job I, on that. Yes, and I think it's also worth mentioning. You mentioned uh, Berta 
as work. Um, the work of Patricia O'Connor, an American academic, um, mm. is also really important. She was probably the first person um, to be allowed into the archives in the 1960s. Mm. Um, she got to see some things that uh, nobody else had seen before she was escorted from the country. Um, and then uh, Manuel Abidjan in the 1980s got in there and was allowed to see quite a lot as well. And his work has been really influential. And then there's a project based in the University of the Basque Country, um, which is very focused mm. on translation, but also used the AGA. And again, we, we've looked at materials from the trace project um, mm. and the translation of censorship. They don't just focus on theatre, but it's one of the aspects they've looked at. So, I mean, we've we've looked at the the very detailed research that other people ha have carried out as well as gone to the archives ourselves. Mm. And That's fact. Yeah. First hand testimonies as well, of course. Mm. Let's not forget that we have spoken to people, we've um, corresponded with them. Um, there are what, some wonderful uh, memoirs and, and autobiographies mm. written by people in, who were involved in some way in all of this. So that's been a very rich element of it is the, the first hand testimony. Yeah, it's certainly, again, as I said uh, in the introduction, I think your project and your book is such a valuable sort of resource for future researchers. So I really hope that a lot of future scholars really mine your work and take some hints and follow in your footsteps. Uh, one interesting moment that actually comes out from this idea of intersection between sort of censorship as a machinery and art seems to be actually the rise of experimental avant-garde and independent theater. I mean, Catherine, you've said that, yeah, beyond censorship of the most, you know, sort of recognized realist theaters and so on, we are in the 60s in a moment where art is taking a different approach, perhaps. Um, and I was thinking, uh, reflecting in that moment, how these more general sort of approach or sort of this more systemic approach to the idea of censorship interact with work that are happening very smaller scales, right? Uh, clearly avant-garde theater or exper experimental theater is not for everyone. Uh, how does it get censored? Does it affect who goes to see these plays? Do they even get performed? Uh, what is sort of your experience looking at these uh, this kind of uh, theater. Yeah, that that is a very interesting. Um, I won't say moment because it's rather longer than a moment, but a mm. <laughs> set of developments. Um, in in that chapter, um, what really comes to the fore is is the tension, the friction between people's understanding of of artistic quality and value on the one hand mm. um and the 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 efforts to to control the distribution um uh, of art so uh, i mean it's always there in the operation of theater censorship but it, it sort of gets particularly sharpened um when they when the censors came to deal with two sets of experimental sort of theater firstly the historical avant-garde Lorca, Valle and Clan, um and alberti and then the new avant-garde that began to emerge in the in the 1960s, well, earlier than the 1960s, really, but came to be noticed in the 1960s. Mm. Um, and so it, it it really posed interesting challenges for the censors themselves. Um, some of the sort of Nuevo Teatro Español writers just assumed that the censors were absolutely um, thick and did not understand what they were trying to do <laughs> and were rejecting innovation out of hand but that mm. really wasn't the case um they were some of them really tied themselves up in knots trying to deal with this business of um how do we define um theater how do we define theatrical quality and we are uh, and they you know they operated in in the sector themselves these people weren't totally outside the theatre. Some of them mm. were working in it, um, or at least they were in the cultural sphere anyway. So they, they in principle, were trying to maintain a theatrical industry uh, and support a certain degree of innovation um, in theory. Uh, and so they, they, it, it's really interesting to see their own mm. struggles and debates about 
we think this is interesting stuff, but oh my God, it's got terrible content in it and language which we cannot possibly allow. What do we do about this? Um, and so that that's one part of what makes that particular phase interesting is, is that d debates that they were having themselves. And then the other part of what makes it so interesting is that the scope that, that emerges from the practitioners, the theater makers themselves for challenging censorship, evading it, um, taking it on and working sort of with it in a way, <laughs> um, attracting audiences partly because they were being censored um, and partly because they were doing things that challenged the censorship and that was a crucial part of the counter culture of the time. Um, so that the, the, those theatrical activities be, uh, b became part of a whole movement of resistance to the regime. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's it's interesting for both of those <laughs> reasons. Um, part of the way the regime managed it was through the use of the, the classification for camera. So it was a way of giving limited authorization. And, and that is a very interesting development to see how they, they worked that system, um, giving limited authorization on the understanding that you were dealing with more sophisticated audiences and smaller audiences, you were limiting the ticket sales, limiting the geographical distribution and so on. Um, so it, it became a very important exercise in just channeling and parceling up this rather disturbing form of culture <laughs> and controlling its distribution. Um, you wanna add anything, Catherine? Um, just to say that, um occasionally you you got the elitist views of some of the censors would come through um so looking at something um avant-garde or experimental they would write well i don't understand it so therefore nobody else will or it's mm. for such a strange minority of people that we don't really care nobody's going to go and see it and this is you know beckett or somebody um mm -hmm. but yeah so actually, you mentioned a foreign uh, uh, playwright, right? So can you move that discussion of the avant-garde of what happened with the censorship machinery dealing with foreign uh, plays? Because you do have a chapter about uh, foreign plays and foreign theater in terms of publication and translations or production of plays. So what was that case? Uh, what, what did the, these cases look like? Okay. Again, what we found out here, as we did, I think, in most chapters, is that it, it was much more complicated than we thought initially. Um, so most of the foreign theatre that was staged in Spain was un unproblematic and staged for its entertainment value, although occasionally something might have a problem with a religious censor because it was considered immoral, but but generally the sort of boulevard dramas or the farces were were acceptable and they were the most common type of foreign theatre uh, overall. Um, we were more interested in looking at foreign theatre that was used politically um, mm -hmm. and it, it shifted over time. Um, also, um, in the chapter, we look a little bit about the idea of translating theatre, um, mm -hmm. because it often wasn't directly translated from Spanish. It might have been um, translated into French or the people whose name was on the translation may just have adapted it from an earlier Spanish publication from South America, for example. So mm. the idea of translation is a little bit messy as well in the context. But we were looking at how foreign drama could be and was used politically. Um, sometimes this was used politically in favour of the regime. So um, very often classical works, um, either Greek classical drama or things like uh, Shakespearean plays, were put on by um, dramatists or adapters um, such as Peyman or uh, Nicolas González Ruiz, uh, both of whom were very, very pro-regime. Um, and they staged plays that were framed in a pro-regime way, um, mm -hmm. showing the glorification of great leaders uh, and so on. Um, or else they were distanced from current Spanish politics because they were about classical periods. Mm -hmm. um, 
Then in the 1950s, again, linked to political developments, you had more North American theatre being accepted into mm. Spain and onto the Spanish stage. But very often this was fairly uh, strongly adapted, let's say. Mm. Uh, so uh, there's one example that um, London gives in his publication of a, a, a play by Thornton Wilder, Our Town, where the set um, in in the Spanish production um, is full of Catholic symbolism that doesn't exist in the original. Mm. Um, but if you also look at the documents in the archive, you can see the the language that they remove, the sections that are taken out, other um, ideas that are put in. And there's a there's a very um, interesting example of a play by Camus, uh, mm -hmm. El Estado de Sitio, which is set in Spain in the original, um, but in the version by Federico Sainz de Robles, all mm -hmm. mention of Spain is removed. So therefore it is acceptable. Um, hmm. So you had plays that were pro-regime, plays that were tamed um, to fit within you know, what was acceptable in Spain. And then you had a, a very small minority, but of very interesting and important playwrights who engaged in what you can call activist translation or activist um, theatre. So they used dramatists such as Brecht and Sartre and Camus and staged them and staged their work in Spain with political intent. Um, and mm. the choice of the, the dramatist itself is their first activist um, um, stance, if you like. Um, so these are plays about oppression, about injustice, mm. about the need for revolution that are staged, as I say, with political intent. Um, so there's a change over time, but I wouldn't like to overstate the um, how much of that activist theatre went on. Mm. I have so many questions I'd like to follow up with, with that uh, explanation, but... Um, we are nearing so the end of the presentation. So I want to leave enough time for our listeners to ask questions. So I'm going to let them know that I'm going to ask my last question. So if you already have your questions prepared, start typing or at least get on the queue to ask your questions. So I'm just giving you heads up. So I'm going to go back for the final question to that idea of sort of that long view uh, sort of the end of when you close uh, your book and thinking about the dismantling of the censorship and you actually take it to 1985 and I'm thinking 85 is not usually well you know the 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 traditional year that we mentioned when we think about the end of the transition we usually take sort of the symbolic victory of the PSOE in 1982 to sort of put that mark, however arbitrary that is, as sort of this moment of the transition. Um, so you take a few years back. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that sort of the ending? And what do you mean by the dismantling of this sort of machinery? Um, what are some of its consequences? What are some of its legacies? Uh, is there anything that remains uh, or is all sort of uh, forgotten and sort of a closed chapter. The, to some extent, the the date of nineteen eighty five is a is a sort of technicality um, it, the, because that that was when the the last piece of the apparatus was finally removed. The Comisión de Calificación that was that was brought in um, to do a um, not exactly censorship, but a but a um, uh, an agreement of uh, age limits for the age of spectators and so on after the abolition in 1978 of full-blown censorship. Um, and, and so, uh, yes, to some extent, it, it's sort of trivial, that date, except that it's not, because um, 19, the, the, the formal abolition in 1978 certainly left things in place. That Comisión de Calificación was still staffed by many of the same people who had been working as censors. It was still mm -hmm. run by Jose Maria Ortiz Martinez, who, who had been running the, the um, 
Junta de Censura for decades previously. Um, and there were certainly within the regime and out there in civil society, there were many of the attitudes um, still prevalent about um, a feeling that culture needed to be controlled and contained and that there was a danger of the transition spinning out of control if people were irresponsible in, in what they expressed and so on. So the, 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 we, we give some um, evidence of those sort of um, attitudes and the atmosphere still persisting. Um, not much, frankly, uh, after 1982, <laughs> because mm -hmm. the socialists did start to really take action. Um, I think one can't really take October 82 as the end of the transition because they still had plenty of things that needed to be mm. done. There was there was legislation to be abolished. There were there were there were new structures to be put in place, and they they did set about doing that quite quickly in the, uh, after October 1982. But they didn't they didn't get round to restructuring the Ministerio de Cultura until you know a, a while after that. And then and then um, we highlight the fact that 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 redefinition of the Ministerio de Cultura was quite explicit, that it contained no role for controlling or regulating theater. It was all to do with promotion and support of theatrical activity. And that was explicitly set out in the, in the legislation, quite different from earlier pieces of legislation, which had referred to ordenación and regulation and things mm. like that. Um, so I, I think it is quite crucial to 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 see the process um, of ending censorship as being a very gradual one. Um, anything to add, Catherine? Um, yeah, in terms of legacies, I would say that's um, an area still to be fully unpicked. Um, I think um, there were reputations were damaged um, mm. in Spain. Um, thinking of foreign dramatists, but not only foreign dramatists. Um, and these were not necessarily changed or reviewed afterwards. Um, one might say something about um, the continuation of patriarchal ideas and how that might have mm -hmm. affected female dramatists going forward. Um, and I think it's fair to say that um, old orthodoxies didn't disappear. Um, I mean, Mike has talked about how attitudes remain the same, some of the people remain the same, but the attitudes continued for much longer. People had been educated to think in particular ways. Mm. Um, and and our dramatists and uh, theatre practitioners are still clashing with old and new orthodoxies um, mm. because theatre never really, uh, theatre censorship never really disappears. It, it mutates or whatever, but the impulse to mm. censor is, is a human one. Um, so it's not the same anymore, but um, there are certainly traces of the old and new examples. That's a very important point, Catherine. We do have questions now. I love the our listeners. They're following instructions so well. So let's go through them. Uh, thank you so much for answering mine. So Andrew Herden uh, asked, were the plays were their plays translated with activist intentions, which the censor managed to water down and make harmless? Catherine? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, water down and make harmless, probably not. I mean, when it was a problem, a very big problem, it was just banned. Um, mm. so I mentioned earlier on um the Camus play, um which eventually was allowed in. I mean, that's an example of maybe being made harmless and that the, all references to Spain were removed. But the people who were going to see that play knew it was by Camus, knew what that meant. Um, if they knew, I mean, even if you remove the word Spain or the reference to Cavith, it's still a plague that is totalitarian, um, that is um, readable as being about Spain. Um, when you are in the context of Spain under a dictatorship. Um, so sometimes things were just banned, but sometimes they were mutated um, in a way that would be horrifying to the original dramatist. But I guess some of the ideas from translation theory tell us that 
the context of the target audience is really important. So the people who are going to see a play by Brecht are going to see a play by Brecht in mm. order to see certain things or to receive certain ideas. Um, so the idea of the target audience is important as well. It's not just how you can frame it or remove certain things. It's also okay. how it's going to be. Thank you. So we have a few questions. I'm going to go through them um, and perhaps the questions can be, you know, a little bit succinct. So Ben Griffith asks, I'm curious how censorship worked in the 19th century in Spain. My impression is that the Inquisition had little power in the early decades of the century before it was dissolved. So I was wondering if you could outline this further. Was the state the main driver of censorship at this time? Also, I know your main focus is theater, but do you have any idea to what extent censorship affected other genres, literature, short stories, and how this compared to theater? That's quite a big question. Uh, big but, question. <laughs> but we can <laughs> pick away at it, parts of it anyway. Um, the, as we mentioned earlier, we did pay some attention in, 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 a, in an opening chapter to the developments through the 19th century. And um, there were various interesting changes. There was a very tough period during the reign of Fernando VII in the 1830s um, when the state really was um, clamping down quite heavily. And it, it was a pretty tyrannical kind of regime in the first place. So that was that surprised nobody. Um, but as a reaction against that, then the, a lot of the rest of the 19th century was relatively liberal in its treatment mm. of freedom of expression. Um, and around the the time of the first republic, uh, and the uh, and then in the the constitution published in eighteen seventy six, um, then they, they 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 there was actually a fairly laissez faire sort of attitude. Um, and um, interestingly, you you get the sense that some people seem to be sort of unsure about what the limits were, <laughs> that the state made efforts to control um, theatrical um, performances. Um, but rather inconsistently, um, and the, and the, there weren't very clear boundaries written, um, which is, I, is exactly what the th the thing that the Francoists wanted to 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 get rid of. <laughs> they wanted mm. absolute certainty, and none of this liberal nineteenth century messing about, <laughs> allowing people to do what they like. Um, but it but it it needs to be borne in mind that that there was almost a whole century of, uh, of activity there in which um, the theater, the modern theater was kind of industry was forming itself. Um, we pay some attention in that early discussion to the business of copyright. Um, actually censorship was in some ways intended to support the enforcement mm -hmm. of copyright <laughs> to make sure right. that companies didn't, didn't uh, just gratuitously get text and and adapt them and, and use them without giving any credit or, or payment to the authors. So there, there is an interesting story there about through the whole 19th century. Um, the the other forms of literature, um, uh, the other forms of uh, of art, literature definitely has, has been censored in various ways through the 19th century and through the 20th century. And it, it was it was controlled at least as severely as theater under the Franco dictatorship. Mm -hmm. um, things changed radically for, for literary publication in 1966 with the Ley de Prensa, which had no effect on performance of theater um, because uh, yes, theater plays could be edited and published more, a bit more freely, but um, the performance side of theater continued to be controlled very tightly after 1966. So that, that, that distinction needs to be made. We could have, um, paid more attention in the book to editions of plays as well as performances mm. of plays, but frankly there wasn't room for that. Um, and there, we do give a little bit of information about film censorship and music censorship, and the film censorship story during the dictatorship is fascinating, and various people have published wonderful books on that. So there's, there's plenty of material on film censorship out there and literary censorship. There's another question, actually, I think Catherine was actually talking about this uh, on our, in our uh, last answer. Uh, Melanie Blanksby um, uh, writes, I'm interested in the legacy of the censorship in the sense that perhaps modern day in Spain has appeared to resist limits for language and content that leaves them now ahead of other countries in tolerance of artistic topics. 
What do you think, Catherine? Hmm. Limits on languages, is that the? Yeah, has appeared to resist limits. So I guess appears to actually so more, be more, more permissive than, than other places. Yeah. Hmm. Um, hmm. Hard to say whether it's more or less permissive. I mean, I do think that the the question of legacy, the issues of what's acceptable or what's not acceptable is constantly changing with what is going on in society. So um, yes, at times um, the response to the cultural sector is very liberal and at times it is not. Um, and I think there have been, um, I mean, there's been a lot of recent um, discussion of this summer um, of plays being uh, taken off or not funded um, by certain um, purse string holders um, for political reasons. And we're talking about culture wars in Spain at the moment. Um, mm. So, you know, this is a moment that's quite tricky um, in terms of um, discussions of how how free things are. I mean, there's a, an organization was set up this summer about um, Stop Censura um because mm. it seems a very live issue still so i don't think spain has entirely moved on and we can say that it is um much better than other places because it shifts mm. i guess as well. there, there have been some really high profile <laughs> cases of censorship of rappers and yeah. there was one play that was essentially a puppet play uh, some years ago um 2016 yeah that mm. that was that was banned by some authority or other um, right. So yes, the, and 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 people who were suffering from that sort of saw that as a hangover from the <laughs> from the dictatorship. It just and in some ways it it might have been because things remain in the Código Penal mm. uh, that that See, might that, have been there for decades. <laughs> and they yeah, the Ley de Mordaza, get, for example, don't normally yeah. get used, but they can be used. So mm -hmm. um, whether the Spanish Código Penal is is more authoritarian than than, than the practice of common law in the United Kingdom, <laughs> I'm not <laughs> quite sure, um, could be. Uh, before we proceed, uh, Pedro Sergio said that we can take some more time because there are plenty of questions, but I also wanted to ask our guests, if is it okay if we follow through some of the questions? This is a very popular topic, obviously, and we have a few questions in the chat box. Would it be okay for me to continue for a little while? Is that okay, Mike, Catherine? Yeah. All right. Okay, so there's another uh, question here from Adriana Cuca that says, was there any attempt to stage plays written by playwrights who are exiled, like Gabriel Garcia Lorca? How are those works regulated under this censorship? Uh, yes, there were attempts. Um, and the case of Federico Garcia Lorca is, is a really fascinating one. Um, <clears throat> There's lots of wonderful evidence in the censorship files of, well, wonderful, no, terrible uh, <laughs> evidence in the censorship files. Wonderful for the researcher to find you know, um, of how the regime, the, the, the Franco regime viewed Garcia Lorca um, and uh, as, a, as a person and cultural figure and what the censors thought of uh, particular works. Um, so uh, yes, uh, one of our case studies is uh, La Casa de Bernarda Alba, and there are other uh, amazing cases in in a later chapter um, about other plays by him. Um, and Lorca was, of course, one of the playwrights that that particularly once you get into the late fifties and, and into the nineteen sixties, that more and more people wanted to stage Lorca's work. As a as a form of protest, as um, just just for the name, as much as anything, and the name did mean something to the regime. They were scared of that name. Um, they they really were were quite neurotic about Garcia Lorca, and were um, and so early on, his works were just completely banned. And there is specific textual evidence of that in some of the files. Betado el autor por la Dirección General de Seguridad. It's as simple as that. Um, but they kept on themselves questioning that, and there were some censors who pushed more than others. My sort of 
mm, hero uh, on the Junta de Censura is Gumercindo Montesagudo, an old phalangista uh, who regularly in the 1940s and 50s and into the early 60s <laughs> was saying, why are we not allowing the work of Federico García Lorca to be staged? This is ridiculous. He's the he's the, he's the greatest playwright we, we've we've had um, in the 20th century, and the world recognizes his work. His work is being staged everywhere else, and yet we are upholding this ridiculous ban, and it's working against us. So um, he he get, he kept on bringing up the argument about la oposición using Lorca as a bandera against the regime, mm. and <laughs> he was right. So they, they they did sort of learn about that. And eventually, uh, and then the, the interesting thing is about further down the line, the, the censors reports on plays by Garcia Lorca suddenly become, well, not very suddenly, but gradually become totally unproblematic. Oh, yes, this is a very important playwright and these are wonderful works. And of course, mm. it can be staged, but <laughs> rubber stamp. Um, so the, the regime went through a process of agonizing about Lorca mm. and about other exiled um, playwrights as well. They were much clearer about, say, Rafael Alberti. Alberti mm. was absolutely unacceptable for a very long time um, because he was explicitly politically opposed to the regime. And he was out there in the world arguing right. against the regime. Um, but, but then actually what really came to be the problem with Alberti's work, some of Alberti's works was not so much the politics, but the, <laughs> the language, the sexuality. Um, they became difficult for other reasons, yes. And sorry, um, so more exile in that sense, so Garcia Lorca was actually killed. Well, um, yeah, so yeah, perhaps, yeah, yeah in, in that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the next question we have is Grace. It uh, says, I've read in the, uh, that there are still censored versions of novels, poetry and films, both translated and originally in Spanish, circulating in Spain even today. I imagine this will be different when it comes to theater, but our censor, but our censor versions of plays still perform today. And if not, was there a cutoff point? The theater companies immediately stop performing censor plays after the dictatorship, or did they still continue? Um, I think it's fair to say that it's a little different um, from the case of novels, for example, but um somebody who wants to put on a play is going to look for a play text um, and it may be that the play text that they're looking for um, exists in published format and is censored. Um, I was looking recently actually about this very issue. I had a quick look um, in the Biblioteca Nacional catalogues to see were there still particular um, censored and published versions of um, works of people like uh, Beckett and Brecht. And it's interesting, if you're looking at very, very well-known figures, there are um, much more recent um, versions and translations available, but the old ones are still there. They're not gone. Um, and it may be the case that the new ones are all in the Biblioteca Nacional, but if you're um, looking at a, library in a small town did they really chuck out the old version they had and buy a new one probably not um <laughs> and the same you might say for school libraries um so i think it's not as much of an issue because also the play text is the starting point when you're putting on a play um but people don't necessarily know what was omitted from the published version that they may have picked up yeah, so some performances took place after the play had already been published. Mm. And so what 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 got censored was some of the lines in the published text. That, that didn't mean the published text became unavailable. It, it was still out there, <laughs> but it, so it depended. Yeah, um, so there's, there's a lot of variation in that. But, it, but yes, it's a more, as Catherine said, it's a more marked phenomenon in relation to novels. Uh, the fact that there are still out there in circulation, lots of novels in their censored form. Yeah. All right. I'm going to read two more questions because we do have a lot of comments, uh, but I think most of them are congratulatory uh, towards your project and this book presentation. So again, congratulations. 
Um, so I'm going to take these two questions uh, before we close this presentation, because I'm sure that you're already uh, a bit tired as well. Um, would you not say, Blanca asked, would you not say that censorship still exists as, for example, Box is stopping plays being shown in some areas of Spain? I believe recently one of them uh, was a Virginia Woolf play. So I think we go back to that idea again of censorship still being present today. Oh, and if Box yes. get their way. Mm. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> right there have been a couple of examples this summer, and that the Orlando yeah. is one of them. Um, and there was another play called El Mar, um, which was censored um in a town in Burgos. And the play was about um the killing of a Republican teacher at the outbreak of the Civil War, and it was in that place or in that um in a town close to where it had actually happened that the play was not supported or um refused funding the official line is that it was for technical reasons um but this is not um accepted by many um who see it as part of the culture wars that are being um promoted uh, by Vox, but it's of course leading to a spats between the Pesoy and Pei Pei as well um, over how culture is being manipulated for political purposes still. Yeah, oh and Vox has the same, a lot of the same ideology as the Franco dictatorship. They're interested in rewriting history, um, peddling a, a particular sanitized distorted vision of history. They're, they are bothered ab about issues of gender identity and um, and immorality and so on. So, yes, it's alarming. So I think this again uh, connects. So this question comes from Lee Mercer, um, a colleague uh, working in the US actually. Um, so I apologize if you addressed this earlier in the presentation as I joined late, but I wonder if your book addresses the question of theater that was adapted for the audiovisual realm during the dictatorship. There was a huge amount of TV theater and historical theater on film produced during this time. Since these productions had the ability to reach more of a mass audience, I'm curious as to whether the censor's hand was heavier with these works or if there was a different balance in the uh, censorship for these uh, productions? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm not sure if we have the answer to that. The book, do we talk about anything that had a link into like a television? Because there were there were certainly useful activities done by Televisión Española of putting theatre on screen, yeah. I think they were very... They were very conservative and cautious about what they chose to put on TV. And there were certainly things that had previously been censored in the theater. Um, so they would they would have needed to have been pretty satisfied that these were um, uh, that these were harmless uh, sort of works that they were putting on on TV. It, it's it's certainly worth looking into, though. That, that mm. could itself be a really important like study. Hmm? I was just saying, if they were made for TV, um, then they would be looked at by a different set of censors also. Mm. Yeah. Um, but we, did, we didn't explore that. But somebody else could. No, but right. somebody else needs to. Yes, there's a project. <laughs> Sounds great. Uh, there are a couple of more questions. I think it was... Uh, just to just finish, we have a couple more minutes. Uh, perhaps we should uh, uh, answer these questions as well. Uh, do you think censor were harsher with foreign works than works originally in Spanish or from Spain itself? That's one. And the next one, it's a little bit more detail. I don't know if we should leave it for another time, but Mike, that's for you. If there's time, if you could explain very briefly why the 19th century became more liberal after Fernando VII, was this a reflex of a delayed arrival of the Enlightenment into Spain? So two quick questions before we close today's presentation. How about right. that? Foreign works, Catherine. Shall I go first? Um, yes. In terms of was the regime kinder to foreign dramatists? Um, Spanish dramatists certainly thought so. Um, and there's quite a bit of evidence to suggest, yes, that if the play was foreign or the playwright was foreign, they were able to get away with saying things that was not tolerated. Um, in a Spanish play or by a Spanish playwright, because the regime was able to distance the 
um, criticism of uh, government or whatever it was from what was happening in Spain. Um, so the distance allowed for, I suppose, uh, tolerance of, of what was said by a foreigner. So yes, on the one hand, but on the other hand, people like uh, Brecht and Sartre were just banned for years. Um, so eventually they, their, their works were staged, but initially any suggestion of staging works by certain foreign dramatists was considered absolutely not acceptable. So a bit of a mixed answer there. Thank you. Mike, 140 characters or less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, F Fernando the Seventh was an extraordinarily unpopular monarch. Um, there, there, was, there, there was a massive change of, um, in society and culture uh, after his departure. Um, and um, it event it led ultimately to to a rejection of the monarchy altogether and 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 a, an experiment with a republic in the uh, in the eighteen seventies. Um, so um, and remember, Spain already had a, a a very proud tradition of liberalism in opposition to Fernando the Seventh um, and 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 in opposition to Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, so you know, liberalism was invented. <laughs> In Spain, in in some people's account, um, so that those those forces were already strong during the reign of Fernando VII, but but were allowed to emerge much more strongly afterwards, um, and that made a big difference to 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 culture, um, uh, and influenced the whole of the rest of the nineteenth century and into the beginning of the twentieth. But that but that precisely was the sort of culture that was totally rejected by the Francoists. The, 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 they saw that as dangerous and having led to communism and dissolution and chaos, and the whole thing needed to be turned back in 1939, in their view. Thank you so much. So we have more congratulatory notes in the comments that you can read. I want to thank you again so much, Mike and Catherine, for this fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for your work. It really is quite extraordinary, uh, the amount of work and valuable resources that you put together in this book. I recommend everyone to read and order for your libraries and your own personal collections. Uh, thank you, uh, Instituto Cervantes and Pedro Sevio for hosting us again uh, for this series. And please don't forget to sign up or join for our next Ex Libris event, November 7th, when uh, we will be hosting Professor Joe Lavani, another sort of mythical figure in our field, uh, in a recently co-authored book, Modern Literatures in Spain, uh, that was published in 2023 by Polity Press. Thank you so much, everyone. Good evening uh, and see you next time. Thank you, Rossi. Thank you, Pedro. Muchas gracias, uh, Catherine and Peter. It was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Rossi.